And here there seems to be um, a serious disconnect. It seems that time in the head, as we experience it in the head, doesn't experience, doesn't um, equal time in the world. So Carlo Rovelli puts this pretty nicely in his recent book, The Order of Time. So he says that I discovered that to my utter astonishment in the physics books I read as a university student, time works quite differently from the way it seems to. And it seems to be the human brain rather than fundamental physics that determines what we call the flowing of time. There's no such thing as the flowing of time in our best theories of physics is the idea. So this whooshing experience is in your head. It's not paralleled or reflected in the world. And this is actually a weird kind of neuroscientific result that comes from physics, because you could predict that there must be some mechanism that constructs flow um, in the head based on the fact that there isn't such a thing in the world outside the head. And then you can go and search for this mechanism. Indeed, people have, and I'll mention some of these, uh, some of this work later on. The area of work that Carlo Rovelli works in is quantum gravity, which is uh, uh, the as yet unsolved um, problem of merging quantum theory, our theory of matter, with gravity, our theory of space-time, um, general relativity, which is the theory of space-time and gravity. As um, Lee Smolin points out, this field, quantum gravity, is a field where it's assumed that time is unreal and that it's just um, an illusion. So basically, um, I wouldn't say it's assumed, by the way, I think there are very good arguments for why it's considered that time is an illusion in quantum gravity. Some of them were given by Lee Smolin himself a long time ago when he worked with Carlo Rovelli on an approach known as loop quantum gravity. The idea um, in a nutshell is basically, it stems from classical general relativity. In that theory, time and space become part of the physics. They become actors in the theory. So they dynamical in the sense that what form they take, what intervals you measure between events, what durations you measure between events, depends on the configuration of mass and energy in the universe. So you have to solve equations to figure out what space and time are like in a universe. That means that the coordinates of space time have no independent meaning. So the physical description you give of some event shouldn't depend on coordinates. But time translation is just an example of a coordinate transformation. So that must be on physical as well. And you would think that this behavior should be respected in the quantum theory of the theory of gravity. So your quantum states shouldn't care about those changes either, just to be consistent with the classical theory. So instead, as Carlo Rovelli does, and he mentions it in, that, um, in his book, The Order of Time, you have to build up your space and time from physical degrees of freedom in the system. So for example, the value of a field at a point x or time t makes no physical sense in general relativity. But the value of that field when and where another field takes on some specific value does make sense, but it's not referring to these bare coordinates. Now, interestingly, even though he's a quantum gravity person by training, Lee Smolin has now taken up uh, a strong defense of the objective reality of time in the very strong sense that there's a present moment that generates new reality as it progresses. So he's going um, in extreme conflict with the orthodoxy in physics. So the situation is this, we have, um, we have this kind of conflict between physics of um, our physical theories of the world and our experience or perceptions of the world. Uh, this explains where, in, where the title comes from of this talk, which is where is time rather than what is time? Is it in the world or is it in the head? So this talk is just gonna present some um, recent elements from this, um, um, from this field. Bertrand Russell puts it, um, rather well. So he says that physics and perception are like two people on opposite sides of a brook, which slowly widens as they walk. At first, it's easy to jump across, but imperceptibly it grows more difficult. And at last, a vast labor is required to get from one side to the other. So one of the, um, the first people that took seriously this idea that there is no change in the world and there's no, no, no role for the notion of a now it was Einstein. So here in this um, a letter he wrote back to a Miss Levatova, who was writing to him about the block universe, he says that your conception of time is the only one possible in accordance with physics for the following reasons. Physics knows only different values of time, but has no possibility of expression for now, present, for past, and for future. 
even if one adds to physics the psychologically so impressively given I now, there exists, according to the theory of relativity, no possibility to coordinate with this I now, unequivocally a present state of the universe. So I'll mention the argument that gets to that in a moment. First, um, this is probably the most famous quote of Einstein about the illusory nature of the flow of time. So this was a letter that he wrote to his friend Mikhail Besso's widow, um, trying to console her. So he writes that now Besso has departed from this strange world a little ahead of me. That means nothing. People like us who, us who believe in physics know that the distinction between past, present and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Now, um, illusions give us a nice way into thinking about this question of where time is, right? Whether it's all in the head, because if we can find and play around with motion and the flow sensations, then it might give us reason to think that the brain is creating that phenomenon in the first place, in the first place, and the world doesn't need to have um, something corresponding to it. So what is an illusion? Well, this is a, a popular one. This is the hollow um, mask. In this case, it's the hollow mask of Einstein. What's happening here is that, as in any illusion, there's supposed to be a mismatch between the properties our experiences represent the world as having and the properties the thing really has, which is pretty much what we're considering here, right? We're experiencing whether our, exper our experiences of flow, so psychologically impressively given, as Einstein puts it, correspond to flow in the world. And then the idea would be, if we can see motion and flow without real motion and flow, then the phenomenon of these properties look like they can be constructed. And various philosophers have defended this, um, Barry Dainton, Laurie Paul, and, and so on. So we know that this is a hollow mask, and yet your brain is telling you that it can't be hollow, and it's forcing it to look as if it projects outwards. And it's only when you rotate the mask that you see, okay, yes, that was an illusion. It's your brain filling in, making best guesses about how it thinks faces should be. It's kind of impressive powers of the brain. Another very impressive illusion having to do with motion is this one by Alice Proverbio. Um, this works best if you look kind of out of the periphery of your vision and it should look like it's moving a bit, but it's not moving one tiny, tiny fraction. So here we have a situation of motion without motion. What's happening here is that an area of your brain uh, known as V5, which is the cortical area devoted to motion processing, is being fooled into thinking there's a sensory signal. Um, by saturating another area known as V4, which is devoted to color and shape processing. So we can have motion without motion. The brain can do that. Uh, probably the most popular illusion used by philosophers is this um, example of the phi or phi phenomenon, where your brain is constructing a notion of a flowing animated movement of these circles, even though there's nothing actually moving. It's just these um, blue squares being removed and reinserted. It's completely static. Um, so philosopher Laurie Paul takes this phenomenon as evidence that passage is a construction of the brain. So she thinks that it, our brains create an illusion of passage for us. And this can be a, a response to a claim of John Norton's, um, who thinks that the only reason we think that there is no time in the world is because our physics theories tell us there isn't. But here's another reason. It looks like our brain, can, we can find evidence that our brain is capable of performing constructions like this. So as she writes, uh, the brain represents the situation as though there is an animated qualitative change. And this representation is as of an animated qualitative change that's no different in character from other sorts of visual experiences as of change that we normally have as part of everyday experience, like the moving uh, second hand on the clock. Clearly, this is a very useful adaptation um, to have, it lets us see things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to distinguish and identify. So here's an example I took from um, an artist, um, Jim Campbell, who was a MIT engineer who turned into an artist and he plays around with these very low resolution images, very low numbers of pixels. So it's very difficult to see what this is if it's a static snapshot. As soon as we allow motion, we can see very quickly that this is people walking around, we have a car coming, we have um, buses going past, as soon as it stops again, even though you know what they are beforehand, they very quickly lose their um, discernibility. So it's quite clearly a very good adaptation to have to identify things if you're in the wild, for example. And indeed, we can eliminate this sense of flow and have something more like a snapshot um, vision if we knock out the area of the brain known as V5 that I mentioned earlier. So some people get lesions in this area of the brain and they get a um, 
a condition known as akinotopsia. And what they mention, what they say that they have is a sequence of snapshots rather than this flowing um, sensation that we get. And they have a lot of trouble kind of walking in um, across roads and so on because they don't see the car as coming towards them. They don't see that kind of motion. They have to rely on memory just as they would with the hour hand on a clock. So they cannot predict where it's going to go at all. They just see it as a series of snapshots. Um, probably, I think the most impressive evidence of the brain's ability to construct your, um, um, your temporal experience is this very recent one, which is known for reasons I won't go into as the illusionary rabbit. So what you have to do here is there's going to be a number of um, flashes on the screen. And you're going to hear a number of beeps as well. And all I want you to do is count the number of flashes. You just count the number of flashes here, and here we go. Okay, so how many flashes did you see? I expect most of you will have seen three flashes. In fact, there were two, um, two flashes, and there were three beeps. And just as with the Einstein mask where your brain is filling in a best guess, your brain waited until it heard the third beep and filled in a third flash in between the other two flashes to provide a best guess. So I'm going to give this again, and you'll count the number of flashes now without the beeps, and you'll have a very different visual experience, even though the flashes are exactly the same as the previous flashes. This is very bizarre, and... I mean, there's something a little bit um, Orwellian about this, to use Daniel Dennett's terminology. There's a doctoring of the historical records in your brain to show a brain-approved version of events. So I mention these things just to show that the notion of time in your head and the notion of temporal experiences is not as simple as we might think and not as simple as um, certain physicists who I'll mention in a moment think. There's no nice mapping of inner and outer going on here. And in fact, the illusion account is looking very well supported, I think, as a result. And this illusion account is the standard um, way that physicists speak. So here's a, um, a very influential paper by James Hartle called The Physics of Now. James Hartle is a physicist who worked with Stephen Hawking and others. He writes that past, present and future are not properties of four dimensional space time, but notions describing how individual iguses, which is, just means information gathering and utilizing system, which is like a physics sanctioned model of an observer of us, how they process information. The present in this case is not a moment of time in the sense of a space-like surface in space time, but there's a localized notion of present at each point along one of these observers, these iguses, world lines. Um, so on this model, time is a construction and it, Hartle tries to construct a model um, within physics. Now this, um, the way he thinks about this corresponds very closely to probably one of the most famous quotes um, about this um, illusion view, which is due to Hermann Weyl. So he says that the objective world simply is, okay, this is Parmenidean view, doesn't happen. Only to the gaze of my consciousness crawling upward along the lifeline of my body does a section of this world come to life as a fleeting image in space which continuously changes in time. So it's the embedded perspective of an observer in space time that causes this intuition. And we can use these kind of accounts from, um, um, from these illusions to sort of pump this uh, intuition a little bit more. 